The first 20 chapters of Matthew have set the stage for what we're going to encounter beginning in chapter 21. Those chapters could be set apart, and in summation titled, How We Got Here From There. Thus far we have learned much about Yeshua's beginnings as a newborn, His time of a blooming self-awareness, the countless miracles of compassionate healing that, that He's performed, His unmatched wisdom and instruction on the Torah and the Prophets that was intended to reform the tradition and synagogue-based Judaism of His time, which explains this growing tension between He and the Jewish religious authorities that intend on maintaining the religious status quo. Finally, He reveals to His inner circle of twelve men from Galilee the divine purpose for which He was sent by His Father in heaven to accomplish, His death and then rising alive from the grave in three days. Now chapter 21 immediately switches the scene from the road going by Jericho, which was chapter 20, to Yeshua's entry into the city of Jerusalem for the biblical feasts of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. There he's going to meet his destiny and change the course of human history. In doing so, he will right a wrong that occurred in the Garden of Eden. So let's read this chapter together. I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. As they were approaching Jerusalem, they came to Beth Perei, Beth Page, on the Mount of Olives. Yeshua had uh, sent two Talmudim, his disciples, two disciples with these instructions: Go into the village that's ahead of you, and you will immediately find a donkey tethered there with its colt. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, tell him the Lord needs them, and he will let them go at once. This happened in order to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, riding humbly on a donkey, on a colt, the offspring of a beast of burden. So the disciples went and did as Yeshua had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, put their robes on them. Yeshua sat on them. Crowds of people carpeted the road with their clothing while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds ahead of Him and behind shouted, Please deliver us to the Son of David. Blessed is He who comes in the name of Adonai. You in the highest heaven, please deliver us. When He entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Who is this? they asked. And the crowds answered, This is Yeshua, the prophet from Nazareth in the Galil. Yeshua entered the temple grounds, and He drove out those who were doing business there, both the merchants and their customers. He upset the decks of the money changers, knocked over the benches of those who were selling pigeons. And He said to them, It has been written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it into a den of robbers. Blind and lame people came up to Him in the temple, and He healed them. But when the head Kohanim, the head priest and the Torah teachers, saw the wonderful things He was doing, and the children crying out in the temple, Please deliver us to the Son of David. They were furious. And they said to Him, Do you hear what they are saying? And Yeshua replied, Of course. Haven't you ever read from the mouths of children and infants you have prepared praise for yourself? Well, with that He left them, and He went outside to the city of Bethania, where He spent the night. The next morning, on his way back to the city, he felt hungry, and spotting a fig tree by the road, he went up up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. So he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree dried up, and the Talmudim saw this, and they were amazed. 
How did the fig tree dry up so quickly? They asked. And Yeshua answered them, Yes, I tell you, if you have trust and don't doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, it'll be done. In other words, you will receive everything you ask for in prayer, no matter what it is, provided you have trust. He went into the temple area, and as he was teaching, the head Kohanim and the elders of the people approached him and demanded, What uh, shmecha do you have that authorizes you to teach these things? Who gave you this shmecha? And Yeshua answered, I too will answer you, uh, ask you a question, and if you answer it, then I will tell you by what semacha I do these things. The immersion of Yochanan, the immersion of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from a human source? Well, they discussed it among themselves. Well, if we say from heaven, he'll say, then why don't you believe him? But if we say from a human source, well, we are afraid of the people, for they all regard Yochanan as a prophet. So they answered, Yeshua, we don't know. And he replied, Then I won't tell you by what Semacha I do these things. But give me your opinion. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I don't want to. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father went to his other son and said the same thing. And this one answered, I will, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what was what his father wanted? The first, they replied, that's right, Yeshua said to them, I tell you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For Yochanan came to you, showing the path to righteousness, and you wouldn't trust him. The tax collectors and prostitutes trusted him, but you, even after you saw this, you didn't change your minds later and trust him. Now listen to another parable. There was a farmer who planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, he built a tower, and then he rented it to tenants and left. And when harvest time came, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his share of the crop. But the tenants seized his servants. This one they beat up, that one they killed, another they stoned. So he he sent some other servants, more than the first group. They did the same to them. Finally, he sent them his son, saying, Well, my son they'll respect. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they grabbed him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they answered him, He will viciously destroy those vicious men and rent out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop when it's due. Well, Yeshua said to them, Haven't you ever read in the Tanakh, the very rock which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This has come from Adonai, and in our eyes it's amazing. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you, It will be given to the kind of people that will produce its fruit. As the head priest and the parushim, the Pharisees, listened to his stories, they saw that he was speaking about them. And when they set about to arrest him, they were afraid of the crowds, because the crowds considered him a prophet. Bible scholars deemed the opening words of of, uh, chapter 21 as the beginning of the Passion narrative. And truly, Jesus' ride up the Jericho road into the eastern gate of Jerusalem across the Mount of Olives is the path to the cross. As we've done throughout our study in Matthew, it's important for a couple of reasons that we examine other Gospel accounts called the Synoptics that speak of the same series of events. It is the general academic belief in the 21st century that Mark's Gospel was used by Luke and by Matthew for much of their 
as much of their source uh, material. Now, I find that to be without merit. As I've stated on earlier occasions, there not only is there no historical evidence for the claim of the priority of Mark, but in fact the very earliest Church Fathers say straight away that Matthew's was the first Gospel written, and Mark came later. Nowhere within ancient Church documents is there a claim that Mark's Gospel was first. Such an assertion is a quite recent one. Why then is there this widely accepted academic mantra that Mark's Gospel is the superior and it was the primary source for Luke and for Matthew? Well, setting aside their opinionated textual and literary criticisms, in the end it is because Mark's Gospel is clearly Gentile oriented and equally clearly has had some later Christian additions to it, which most of these same Bible scholars readily acknowledge. Okay, that is, Mark's Gospel was always intended as a Gentile friendly Gospel, regularly finding fault with the twelve Jewish disciples, and so in time it became the go-to gospel for the Gentile church institution. On the other hand, Matthew's gospel was always intended for a Jewish audience, displayed a more balanced narrative towards the disciples, and this fact made Matthew's gospel kind of the the red-haired stepchild for the for, for Roman Christianity that regularly complained over New Testament books that they deemed too Jewish. And as a result, the more conspicuously Jewish-oriented books like James and Hebrews were excluded and then re-included from Bibles in long cycles over the centuries. Now this is not to diminish the Gospel of Mark or Luke in any way, but rather to make a distinction between them. Understanding this distinction helps us to realize in what context and for what purpose and what kind of of readership each Gospel was originally created. There is nothing wrong with Mark writing a Gospel account for the life of Christ for an interested Gentile audience, and it doesn't make what he says as inaccurate. It's only that when we can grasp the reality of differences among the Gospels and see it as a net positive, not a a negative, then we can better understand the reasons for the choice of events each Gospel author highlighted the way in which each writer presented them. Therefore, we will read portions of this same event of Christ's entry into Jerusalem and what immediately proceeded from it in Mark's Gospel. And we're going to do that so we can have a balanced approach. But we're only going to do that in small chunks, as the amount of information is just too great to take in all at once. We're also going to go at it in sections in Matthew 21, because this chapter can be divided up into several distinct events that are rather obvious. It makes it easier for study. The opening 11 verses cover Yeshua's entry into Jerusalem, known in Christendom as the Triumphal Entry. Verses 12 through 17 tell about His storming into the temple to express His deep displeasure about the commerce that was inappropriately going on there. Next is Jesus cursing the fig tree. This is reported in verses 18 through 22. Afterward is a tense encounter between Yeshua and the temple and synagogue authorities over the source of His authority to teach and to do what He's doing as a master of of a flock of disciples. This is in verses 23-27. through 
This is followed by verses 28 through 32 with a parable about a man with two sons who weren't reliable. And then another and different parable from verse 33 to the end of the chapter about the wicked tenants of a landowner and how the moral of the story was obviously aimed at the chief priests and the synagogue elders and scribes who didn't appreciate such an, attack, such an attack. They didn't like that too much. Now because each of these recorded events has its meaning so deeply rooted in the Jewish culture of the first century, significant explanation is required to extract it. So here we go. Open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. It's just a few pages ahead of where you are in Matthew 21. Mark chapter 11. We're only going to read the first 10 verses. Mark chapter 11. As they were approaching Jerusalem near Beth Pere, that's Beth Page and Beth Anya, Bethany, by the Mount of Olives, Yeshua sent two of his Talmudim with these instructions Go into the village ahead of you, and as soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, uh, tied there that has never been ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? <clears throat> tell him the Lord needs it, and he will send it here right away. Well, they went off and found a colt in the street, tied in a doorway. They untied it. The bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? And they gave the answer Yeshua had told them to give, and they let them continue. They brought the colt to Yeshua and threw their robes on it, and He sat on it. Many people carpeted the road with their clothing, while others spread out green branches which they had cut in the fields. Those were, who were ahead and those behind shouted, Please deliver us! Blessed is He who comes in the name of Adonai! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, and you in the highest heaven, please deliver us! Now we're told in Matthew 21, verse 1, that as Jesus and His disciples, and no doubt a growing crowd following Him, approached Jerusalem, some having followed Jesus all the way from the Galilee, <clears throat> the first in, uh, the first in, they first encountered the enclave of uh, Bethpage. In Hebrew it's Beit Page, and the name means House of Figs. The suburb of Jerusalem was located on the side of the Mount of Olives. So why would Jesus and His sizable entourage be entering Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives? Because the road from Jericho went that way. And therefore it makes its entry into Jerusalem through what's called the Eastern Gate. Later in the Gospel of Matthew, we'll find Jesus staying overnight with a family in Bethpage. Now I characterized Bethpage as a, a suburb of Jerusalem. But you know in reality, when people of that era spoke of Jerusalem, in their minds Jerusalem included the enclave of Bethpage. You know, it's, it's exactly like in Southern California where residents might say when asked where they live, they live in Los Angeles. They live in LA. However, the actual city of Los Angeles doesn't cover a very big area. Rather, the many suburbs surrounding Los Angeles have grown together into one giant population center. The only way you even know which town or city you're in is if you encounter a street sign that tells you. So it's just easier to say Los Angeles, which is known worldwide, and few Southern Californians would think that you meant you actually lived within the formal city limits of the incorporated city of Los Angeles. Well, at the time of the biblical feasts, especially that of Passover and then later on in the fall of Sukkot, the city of Jerusalem swelled tenfold with the number of people there. I mean, the increase was of course due to the scores of thousands 
of Jewish pilgrims that journeyed to the holy city to celebrate what is called uh, the pilgrimage feasts. There are three of the biblical feasts wherein the Law of Moses requires every Jew, or at least a representative of every Jewish family, to make a journey to the temple. Of course, due to the two exiles Israel had suffered, the Assyrian in the 8th century and then later the Babylonian in the 6th centuries BC, all but the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin were now entirely dispersed and scattered all over the Asian and European continents, even to North Africa. So for the majority of Israelites, they would never make a journey to the temple in their lifetimes. And the Jewish diaspora only infrequently, due to the, the great cost, the danger, the, the time involved to travel so far. Even Jews living in the Galilee that was but a few days walk to Jerusalem only occasionally made that trip, and certainly if they did, it was only to attend perhaps one of the three special pilgrimage, pilgrimage feasts of, of Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot in that year. So it's important to understand <clears throat> that in all of the Synoptic Gospel accounts we'll only find the Galilean resident Jesus in Jerusalem of Judea for the occasions of the Biblical feasts. And the one He's here for now is Passover. Now, although we won't get into the details of it for the moment, it's good for us to recognize that there was much intended symbolism involved in Yeshua entering Jerusalem from the eastern side by traveling over the Mount of Olives. See, the prophet Zechariah especially speaks of the Mount of Olives as the place where great end times events will occur, which of course includes the involvement of the Messiah. And speaking of symbolism, it's also important to take much of what Jesus does in the remainder of the book of Matthew within the context of Him playing out in an orchestrated manner the prophesied events spoken of by some of the ancient Hebrew prophets. I say this to you because it's not as though Christ was being driven forward towards His fate by some invisible hand and Him not having any idea of what was coming next. Or that by divine serendipity He would just do this and that. He understands that the prophets of old were quite specific in some things about what the Messiah would do, where He would do them, even at, some, at times what He would say, in order to prove that He was indeed that foretold Messiah, Yeshua did those things. Now before He enters the Eastern Gate, Yeshua sends two of His twelve disciples ahead to Bethpage to fetch a donkey and its young offspring, called a colt or a foal. Now here we have a discrepancy between Mark and Matthew. Mark has Yeshua saying to His disciples, Go into the village ahead of you, and as soon as you enter it you will find a colt tied there that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. In other words, Mark has Jesus requesting but one animal, only a foal while Matthew has him requesting two. Why the difference? There's no scholarly consensus on this. However, some newer understandings do help to untangle this a little bit, because verse 7 in Matthew 21 also says, Yeshua rode on them, plural. So are we to think that Jesus rode up to the gate of Jerusalem straddling two donkeys. That is a strange picture. <clears throat> well, without doubt, what Matthew is speaking about and what Yeshua is requesting is to bring about the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9 which says, Rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Zion! Shout out loud, daughter of Jerusalem! 
Look, your king's coming to you. He is righteous and he is victorious, yet he is humble. He's riding on a donkey. Yes, on a lowly donkey's colt. <clears throat> now, Hebrew sages, well, they took the meaning of this passage in Zechariah to indicate that the mysterious person spoken of came into Jerusalem on two donkeys the mother and its foal, its colt. <clears throat> so we're talking about a full-grown female donkey and her baby donkey. Now common sense then as now is that no one, except perhaps a small child, would ever climb onto the back of a baby donkey. So it would seem that while there were two animals involved, only the larger, more mature one would have actually been ridden. But is there any kind of evidence that such a scenario could be the case? Well, actually there is. In the Mishnah Bhava Batra 5.3, we find that a mother donkey could only be sold or used for work along with its foal. See, a mother donkey and her baby, they were seen as one, a single connected unit. Now obviously, since this matter of a donkey and its foal is Jewish tradition, halakha, then Matthew would have been aware of it, while Mark, perhaps he was not. Or if Mark was aware, he might not have found it helpful to mention the issue, issue of the mother donkey along with its colt to a Gentile audience unless he took the time to explain the context for it, like I'm explaining it to you. Matthew, on the other hand, well, he took it for granted that his Jewish audience already understood the reason behind the mention of two donkeys, a mother and its colt, and why they obviously would have remained together. So Christ sends two disciples into Bethpage and in foreknowledge says they're going to find this mother and its colt tied up and they are to bring them to Him. Understand, this foreknowledge, while of course having a divine element to it, is also Jesus firmly expecting that it's going to happen. Because He is the one that Zechariah 9.9 prophesied about. So He has no doubt that His disciples are well, going to find that mother in cold, and that they will be able to bring it to Him for His temporary use. Jesus also says that if anyone says anything about the donkeys, they're to say, the Lord needs them, and He'll let them go at once. Well, depending on which Bible version you're using, this verse, as it has it in the complete Jewish Bible, says, the Lord needs them. That's big L, Lord. Or, in other Bible versions, the Lord needs them. That's little L, Lord. Or, in other versions, the Master needs them. See, the Greek being translated is kurios, and it has no inherent religious or spiritual sense to it. The issue is that when we use big L Lord, then of course the Christian sense of it is Jesus is being addressed as the divine Lord and Savior. Little L Lord. It's a little bit more difficult for English speakers to deal with because about the only way that that form of word is used in the Western societies is in the religious sense. Or perhaps maybe in England is an aristocratic title, but in fact, what the little L Lord actually means is better expressed as the third option of master. Because master denotes a person who teaches person who leads a flock. See, that's the sense of it that's meant here. The big L Lord is reading centuries later, 
Christian thoughts back into it. So it was the crowd's acclamation of respect for Him. Not that they saw Yeshua as divine or as their Messiah. Now verse 4 explicitly voices what I have been saying to you about the motive behind Jesus doing the things He was doing, saying the things He was saying, orchestrating them. Because it says in Matthew 21, 4, this happened in order to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. The prophet was Zechariah. See, it must not go unnoticed that Mark makes no mention of Christ fulfilling prophecy. It makes me suspect that he may not even been aware of those prophecies. Or perhaps because he thought it wouldn't have meant much to his Gentile Roman audience. Matthew, being the scholarly Jew, writing for Jews, has proved himself to have been well trained in both the Tanakh and in Halakha. So he recognizes what's happening. He comments on it because, you see, verse 4 now, verse 4 is Matthew's personal conclusion about what all this business is, about the way Christ entered Jerusalem and the two donkeys He requested to, what it all amounts to. But there's even more to unpack about the first century Jewish mind than this concerning Yeshua's entry into the city. I'm going to say it briefly and embellish it later, but I just want you to, to tuck this away, okay? Just tuck this away for the time being. Shlomo, Solomon, King David's son, he rode into Gihon on a donkey to be anointed as Israel's next king. The King David, Solomon, Yeshua connection, it's all been front and center throughout Matthew's Gospel and it continues when Yeshua says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you riding humbly on a donkey, on a colt, the offspring of a beast of burden. Who is the daughter of Zion? Who's the daughter of Zion? It's the people of Jerusalem. Let's talk about Jerusalem for a little while. See, much too often, Bible commentators take the terms Israel and Jerusalem as synonymous. That is, when it concerns the latter days and end times and Messianic prophecies, sometimes we're going to hear things about them happening to Jerusalem. Other times we'll hear about it happening to Israel. I can tell you without hesitation that we must not see Jerusalem and Israel as interchangeable terms. Okay, let's begin with the obvious. The infrastructure and the stone walls and the paved streets of Jerusalem are not the point of most of the prophecies about, the, about Jerusalem. It's about the residents of Jerusalem. Or even more specifically, about the religious leadership of the Jews that, of course, reside in Jerusalem as the ancient and ongoing capital city of Israel and, frankly, spiritual center of the world. Now, I'm going to use the following illustration that I hope can make what I'm trying to tell you more clear. Let's equate the term Israel with the United States. Let's also equate Jerusalem with Washington, D.C. Now, the United States, on the one hand, is merely a piece of geography. Washington, D.C., well, that's the place, the geographical location where our national government resides. Yet, in reality, what the United States means in practice has to do with we, the people, who occupy it. And in reality, 
What Washington, D.C. means in practice is the leaders, the human beings, who govern us. Now for the Jews in the first century and earlier, it was only the temple within the city of Jerusalem where the leadership congregated, the religious leadership, and made governing decisions. Just as within Washington, D.C., it's the Congress building where the leadership congregates and makes governing decisions. So as Americans, we can make a distinction between the USA and our capital city, as well as a further distinction between the capital city and the pinpoint location where governing actually occurs. And when we talk about our nation and the governance, we can use all kinds of terms to discuss it. But any teen or adult carries the understanding about the USA, Washington, D.C., and the Capitol building as kind of a given context. Okay. It works the same in the Bible. So while Jerusalem is, of course, part of Israel, as Israel's capital, it can be spoken of a little differently than the rest of Israel. And while the temple is within the city of Jerusalem, yet the temple can be spoken of a little differently than the rest of Jerusalem. Thus when Yeshua says, tell the daughter of Zion, He means tell the people of Jerusalem. So we must not expand this to mean tell the people of Israel. Yet even more, Zion is a term that is associated in Bible prophecy with redemption and with the latter days and the end times. So when Yeshua says Zion, He is setting a tone which the people who heard Him understood as incorporating a, a, an end times motif in what He was saying. Now remember, okay, due to the Roman occupation, most Jews already thought they were living in the end times. So this wasn't a big leap for them. Now the remainder of what Jesus says is, Look, your king is coming to you riding humbly on a donkey and on a colt, the offspring of a beast of burden. Now this pronouncement is simply loaded with explosive ramifications. The term king would have set the Roman and Jewish leadership on edge. I mean, this sounds like sedition. And it's the very thing the Romans were always on the lookout to prevent. But to Jews, king indeed meant the messianic king of Israel, the next King David. However, Yeshua throws a, a curveball into his words when he says he is riding humbly. The Greek word is praeus. And the complete Jewish Bible choice of the word humbly as the translation for it isn't the best. Rather, the better choice is meek. Meek. Because praeus means to have a mild disposition, a, a gentleness of spirit. So he is announcing his coming, not as a victorious military leader like David, but rather he is coming, how? Meekly. He's coming peaceably. So clearly sedition and an uprising with a motive of ejecting the hated Romans from the Holy Land and him becoming Israel's first reigning Jewish king in many centuries, well that was just off the table. So when the disciples return with the mother donkey and her colt, we, re we read that the disciples put their garments on them and Jesus climbed aboard. Now the words to end verse 7 are, and He sat upon them, most commonly. Bible commentators say that the them that Jesus sat upon was the two donkeys. But since I've shown you that that makes no sense, then the them must be referring to the garments. 
that the disciples placed on the donkeys. That is, Yeshua sat on the garments. He sat on them. But then we read in verse 8 that the crowd started laying their garments down on the road for Christ's mount to walk upon. Others went and gathered tree branches, no doubt meaning palm branches, to line the road. What's the meaning of these actions? But first, important question, who makes up the crowds? It means mostly the crowds that had followed Jesus from the Galilee and then others He kind of picked up along the way. Now remember, it was Passover and thousands of pilgrims were traveling to Jerusalem on that road. It would not have been the residents in Jerusalem because with them He would had very limited interaction. Well, the act of one taking off their garment, this means a cloak of some kind, and putting it on the roadway was a means by which a common Jew could welcome someone of great status. In that era, one's garments symbolically represented the person. So to put one's garment at a king's feet was to publicly demonstrate personal submission to that king. 2 Kings 9, 11-13, Jehu returned to the servants of his Lord, and one of them said to him, Is everything all right? Why did this Meshuga, why did this crazy person come to you? And he answered them, You know the kind and how they babble. They said, You're being evasive. Come on, tell us the truth. Then he says, this is exactly what he said to me and how he said it. Here is what Adonai says, I have anointed you king over Israel. At this they hurried each one to take his cloak and put it under Yehu at the top of the stairs. Then they blew a shofar and proclaimed Yehu as king. So using their garments, their cloaks, in this way was among Jews a rarely used, but it was a recognized and customary gesture of acclamation of a very important person. Biblically, it was usually used in association with a king. Now, this might be the first time we find Yeshua placing Himself above others by riding on an animal in a symbolic way it sort of separates him from the people he's been among and he's so selflessly served. So, who exactly did these excited crowds think he was? What did he represent to them? See, verse 9 says the crowds roared, Please deliver us. To the Son of David, blessed is He who comes in the name of Adonai, you in the highest heaven, please deliver us. First of all, where in the complete Jewish Bible it reads, you in the highest heaven. The word heaven is not there in the Greek. Other translations do a little job because they say, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Second, some more context. We must recognize that for the Gospel writer Matthew, Yeshua enters Jerusalem as the Son of David and decidedly not as the Son of Man or the Son of God. See, this has a substantial effect on the way that Matthew characterizes how the crowds outside of Jerusalem perceive Jesus outside of Jerusalem. And so the acclamation that they shouted towards Him, what it was meant to convey. See, the key word, Hosanna, which you find in in English, deliver us or save us, it comes from the Hebrew, Hosanna, which is really two words, which can literally mean either save now or save we pray. Save now is a rather odd statement in the current circumstance, and save we pray fits a little better. It could well mean what is most often it's most often taken to mean. It is that the crowd is pleading with Yeshua to deliver them 
from the hands of the Romans yet. Some Hebrew linguists say that looking at Psalm 118 and its use in all the pilgrimage festivals and what message it means to convey in the term Hosea is that while in some cases it is meant in the sense of deliver us, it is far more likely in Christ's entry into Jerusalem in this scenario that it simply means praise. Now remember, just because a couple of words literally may mean something else, in every language we have what we call expressions. Expressions. It makes no sense if the individual words are taken literally. But the words taken together as a unit, well, that communicates a recognized meaning. I'll give you some examples. Go fly a kite. Don't let the cat out of the bag. Oh no, we're in a pickle now. See, I could go on for some time with expressions like this. But if a person of another country or another language tried to translate my English words literally, tried to understand them as meaning something fully literal, well, they'd be far off the mark and pretty confused. So it seems that in some circumstances, the Hebrew words Hosea were but an acclamation of praise. In other words, perhaps a better translation in English, in the modern way of how we use words. All right, verse 8 should read, Praise to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise in the highest. See, Eusebius and Jerome both took it to mean this. See, it's hard to know for certain which way it was meant, as a praise or a plea to, to deliver, to rescue. See, the problem here for me is that this thing that they said towards Yeshua is but an often used verse that's taken from the Hallel, which is Psalm 118. And it had become very nearly a chant because while it was supposed to have originally been used for the Sukkot ceremony, it became so popular that it was used at all the biblical festivals, including at Passover. And I'm afraid we're just going to have to leave it there. It's entirely possible that some of the, those yelling out those words towards Christ meant it one way and some meant it the other way. It's entirely possible. On the other hand, this is yet another time that we hear people calling out the familiar Son of David towards Christ. And each time we've run across this in Matthew, I have explained that what this must have conjured up for those saying it is the image of King Solomon who indeed was King David's biological son. This is because Solomon was remembered as the wisest of the wisdom teachers, a Torah expert, a miracle healer, and an exorcist of demon possession par excellence. This is precisely how Jesus was viewed by the crowds because this precisely fits with how He presented Himself. It's all by all the things He actually said and did. Now remember, still as of the time of His entry into Jerusalem, the only people to whom He had confessed that He was Israel's Messiah was His inner circle of twelve. And they were to keep this as a tight secret. So the crowds didn't just suddenly out of the blue surmise on their own that Yeshua was their Messiah and God's Son. Here's something else to keep in mind. King David and King Solomon were as opposite from one another as the colors black and white. 
King David's persona and reputation was as a ferocious warrior leader who won countless battles against Israel's many enemies. King Solomon, well, he was a builder, an intellectual, a healer, a diplomat. His Hebrew name, Shlomo, is connected to the Hebrew root word Shalom. Solomon then was King David's peace child. And this is why God refused to allow King David to build a temple. But rather he decided that Solomon would do that. So King Solomon, see, he's part of the mold in which the crowds see Yeshua. That is, Yeshua carries the spirit of Solomon with him as what? The son of David. Not the, not the spirit of King David himself. And yet, when we indeed arrive at the end times, and Messiah Yeshua returns, we know from the book of Revelation that He will not come back in the spirit of the peace child Solomon, as with His entry into Jerusalem, but rather it will be in the spirit of the invincible and ruthless warrior David that will carry out the Father's wrath. Matthew says the whole city shook as Jesus approached. This is not to be taken literally. The Greek word is esiethi, and although it literally means the effects of a strong earthquake, it's an expression. That is the equivalent of the English expression about a startled, now disoriented, disoriented person being all shook up. So the all shook up residents of Jerusalem Asked the question found in verse 10 Who is this? Who is this? Now, notice this is important. This is not the crowds that have been following Yeshua and laying their garments on the road that are saying, Who is this? But rather, this is referring to the flabbergasted and annoyed residents of the city of Jerusalem asking this question. Who is this does not mean what's his name. Rather, it means what ought we to make of this fellow? See, it's actually kind of an indignant remark. It would be the equivalent of something my mother used to say to me when I was a teen, more times than she should have had to say. She'd say, Just who do you think you are, young man? Now, I'm fairly convinced she knew who I was. <laughs> Rather more she meant, who does your high and mighty attitude make you think you are that you can act that way? That's what she meant. So now the indignant residents of Jerusalem adopt a negative perception of Christ as a person who unsettles their lives. He's an unwanted troublemaker. Therefore, in verse 11 now, the response to the disgruntled and unimpressed residents of Jerusalem comes from the crowds, and who are they? Mostly those Galileans that have been following Yeshua for some days. And to answer the question of who is this, who is this, what do they respond with? This is Yeshua, the prophet from Nazareth in the Galil. Now, while for the proud Galileans, their very own prophet from Nazareth was a wonderful thing. The residents of Jerusalem had dealt too many times with would-be prophets coming to town during festivals that did nothing but stir up trouble. They didn't have much use, anyway, for Galileans, because they regarded them as rough, uncouth and not particularly intelligent. One has to wonder what the adoring crowd was mentally picturing when they characterized Jesus as a prophet. 
I suspect it was meant in connection to Moses. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19, Adonai will raise up for you a prophet like me from among yourselves, from your own kinsmen, and you are to pay attention to him. Just as when you were assembled at Horeb and requested Adonai your God, don't let them hear the voice of Adonai my God anymore, or let them let me see this great fire ever again. If I do, I'll die. On that occasion, Adonai said to me, they are right in what they're saying. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I order him. Whoever doesn't listen to my words, which he'll speak in my name, will have to account for himself to me. Perhaps those crowds weren't certain of it, but it had been a great hope for a long time in Israel's history that such a prophet like Moses would appear and Yeshua bore all the earmarks. Little did I know just how right they were. Well, I can do no better to conclude our lesson on the triumphal entry than to lift a quote from the Davies and Allison commentary on this passage that so I think profoundly sums up what we've been reading and studying. It says this, The daughter of Zion, for whose sake Jesus comes, does not comprehend the tumult before her gates, or understand that her King has come, and that prophecy has been fulfilled. Even the momentary acclamation that Jesus does receive is from those going up to the capital, not those within it. As Jesus leaves the sympathetic pilgrims, to encounter the hostility of the holy city, he is exchanging his royal mount for a criminal's cross. His exit will not be as his entrance. We'll continue next time as Yeshua enters the temple and he shakes things up yet again.